I guess, do I want to, I don't, I don't like standing so much. I'll sit here and maybe get up. Um, so, my name is Esko Reynikan, and if you've been watching the OGTAMP uh, camp hashtag, I'm the one with the Yoda avatar. Um, and the reason, part of this government hacking thing, I train public servants to become humans again. Um, and uh, they've given me the nickname of Yoda, so that's why that's there. It's not because I've got some big ego um, problems, or maybe I do. So, what's government hacking about, really? The basic premise is that, hello, welcome. Uh, the governments that we have in this day and age were actually set up to service the requirements of society in the 18th century. And they're like big oil tankers that are inflexible and don't move very well. And so by and large, the governments you have now, whether they're central government or local government departments, are institutions that were built to service a problem that existed 200 years ago. Um, and they do evolve a little bit incrementally, um, but as a consequence, um, uh, what we have is institutions that don't understand or reflect or relate to society as we currently have it. Uh, so we've got a kind of a visual model, which is government travels in a straight line and societal expectation is now on an exponential evolutionary curve. And particularly, some of the people in this room who are developing those technologies that allow hyper-connectivity and, and, and whatever, are creating a new world that's more reflected in terms of, uh, uh, that look, is more characterized by the idea of networks than hierarchical command and control siloed institutions, which by and large governments are. So, worldwide, and also in the UK, there's a small group of people, um, some of who are former government employees who have left and set external consultancies, and some of whom are still embedded in government institutions of what you might call the government hackers, who say, this isn't good anymore, this isn't good enough anymore, and we need to effect a, a root and branch transformation, radical innovation within government, so that we can kind of reposition the path of government to a parallel one to society and social expectations. And my particular role in this is I run innovation labs in local government, currently in Wales. We have a whole county which is now a laboratory area that's open to um, a kind of radical transformations. Uh, and we also, under the umbrella of a NESTA project, NESTA is the Na National Endowment for Science, Technology and the Arts. Um, under their public services program, we work with other local authorities and some central government departments in, in the UK. Sorry, which county is that? Uh, the one I'm with is Monmouthshire in Wales. So some of you might have heard of uh, Monmouthpedia, the first Wikipedia town. Um, so that's one of the, uh, I guess, byproducts it is of a public authority which starts to be able to see the world as it actually is, rather than um, um, how it thinks people should see it and like it. And so the different bits of this umbrella program are looking at different challenges. So for example, Stoke is one of the uh, cities and they're looking at how can we make um, a within a, a local government boundary an area entirely energy self-sufficient. And bear in mind that Stoke is based on ceramics industry, which has really high power consumption um, kind of things. Uh, Cornwall is one of the, the uh, councils participating, and they're building tools that allow the citizenry to co connect with each other in order to provide mutual assistance in areas which traditionally were deemed government service areas, but which we don't do very well or um, uh, welcome. And my particular, uh, I guess, take on this is that the problem is a cultural one, right? It's the culture of government that's a deficit here. So um, you might, somebody on the outside might develop a tool or a program um, that helps fix something that's broken on, on, on a kind of a, a process basis. But actually, if the people in the government are still these running like hamsters over the wheel, uh, pre-programmed, don't like to listen to people, public servants, then this is just kind of tinkering on the side. So what we think, our insight, is that you actually need to um, uh, reprogram the human to be human again within the government. So some of you might have had this experience where you call your council and normally you just want your bins picked up and you want your roads not to have potholes and that's all you really want from your local government. 
but they give you this big council tax bill um, and that means that you're paying for this, 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 and this other service that you don't really know about or care or, uh, or want. And when you do have a problem, generally it's going to be a planning application kind of thing. You call the council, somebody goes, oh, I don't know what you're talking about, it's not my job, and they pass you to another department and you go into a death loop um, with no resolution at the end of it. And that's because humans in that system, the prevalent culture of government, dehumanizes good people who go into the system and then they become these kind of robots that can't do anything for you anymore. Um, or when a difficult problem comes on the plate, they say, it can't be done. And you ask, why can't it be done? Well, because there's a rule about that. Well, why is, who made that rule? Well, we did. So, can't we change the rule? Well, I guess we could, but we've never been programmed to think that way. Um, so that's basically where I'm, where I'm coming from. I'm trying to write the new cultural genetic code for a government in the 21st century that works. Uh, so as I said, uh, for those who've just come in, I said this conversation can go one of, one of two ways. So that's the broad brush, kind of what the, the, the government hacking movement is at in the, in the UK uh, at the moment. Uh, one thing we can talk about is the kind of the specific things that we're doing and whether there's questions or suggestions um, uh, to take things forward. And the other is in terms of building, uh, building a, a wider development community. Let's call it an open source development community. This genetic code we're writing, we want to open source it so that other partners, um, we have partners in Finland and in the US and in other countries, um, uh, can make use of, of the tools that we're, we're developing to do this government evolution and use them in their context. So in that vein, we've tried things like um, we had a subversion repository where we put documents up and we thought, okay, anybody else who's interested in this might go there and look at our documents and make uh, edits and kind of uh, contribute their thinking into it that we can then benefit back from that. It turns out most of the people who are involved in this government hacking work don't know how to use subversion repositories. So our next idea now is to, to wikify the, the work because that's a bit more user accessible. So if you have a particular interest in the work that we've done, there is a wiki. It's um, uh, the URL is uh, it's your county, your way. So that's yc-yw.co.uk. You can go there, and all of the stuff that we've come up with in terms of how you tune and, and reprogram your government is in there. It's quite raw and basic at the moment, but. What we don't know how to do yet is present the work we've done to date to a wider development community who's interested in this subject. And I don't care if you're in government or not, Pre preferably we'd like users of government services to get involved in this. But we don't know yet what's the best way how to present the work and, and, and create the call to arms and develop this kind of wider development community. So I don't know, shall we... Um, uh, maybe one last point to, to mention is that this, isn't, this is true of the UK specifically. When you look at the voter turnouts in the last couple of elections, in some areas you're looking at like 30 to 35 percent turnout. What that means is our analysis of that is that those people who are bothered to, uh, uh, um, uh, to, to come and vote, they find something interesting or something worthwhile that's posited to them on the left to right spectrum of political choice, right? But the vast majority of people don't even go to vote. So then we look at another uh, axis and we say there's the inside and there's the outside. And we're fully aware that a lot of people are, uh, choose to be on the outside because they're so disgusted and disenfranchised with what they see happening on the inside. So that's the other task. How do we, how do we destroy, what, what do we need to do in order to destroy that boundary that kind of excludes a lot of the people from their governance institutions? Um, what do we need to get rid of on the inside? Um, in our particular case, we're going to have to get rid of a third of the workforce in the next three years. Now traditionally how you would do that is the chief executive will say to his top um, uh, uh, lieutenants, uh, show me what a third less looks like. And in a hierarchy where you've got a social dynamic, we label feudal social dynamics, what's going to happen is that the top lieutenants are going to eliminate their enemies 
and get rid of the problematic things. So you don't get a better public service at the end, you get a baron with a more entrenched position. So we're looking at things like how do we target the, the obstructionist, gatekeeper, power-hungry little baron and get rid of that problem, freeing up resource for the things that really matter. Or, yeah. Anyway, I, I can go on for ages in particular, but now I want to take a kind of a, a quick poll of the audience. Are you more interested in kind of pursuing the, the specific dynamics of the, the, the tools and the processes and the ideas that we're playing with? Or are you more interested in talking about how we can build a, a, a more effective and a wider development community? Um, how should we do this? Any ideas? Huh? Show of hands. Show of hands, yeah. So, shall we do the first one, which is talking about kind of the specifics and the, the dynamics, right? One, two, ooh, quite, this is going to be hard. I should have that red and yellow card thing. <laughs> okay, um, and how about the other one, how to build the development community um, uh, for this? Okay. <laughs> I think by a fair margin, it's the first one that, that, that has it. So before I, I kind of... Uh, maybe lay out some of these things. Are there any questions already, given what I've already said? So I was interested in how far out of place you think government is from the rest of the society. Whether, so if, you, if you try to follow society directly, you'd be switching from more kidneys to life at night. Yeah. So it's kind of, is there meant to be like a longer, more enduring thing for government? To, sure. To I, I see that on the extreme as well. Our hunch is that the ultimate goal isn't, uh, is actually to create a kind of a parallel path which has the flexibility to kind of sway and respond to the... What, what you don't want to do is turn your government totally into populist uh, uh, thing. Um, but, so, in that model where you've got the path of government and then societal expectation, you've got a growing gap. And that's a dangerous space because in there you get populist groups occupying the space and, and that can be good or that can be quite dangerous. I mean, if you want to understand why um, groups, I don't want to get overtly political, but why groups like BNP and UKIP had um, uh, successes in recent elections, that's the reason why. It's because people are totally dissatisfied with what your traditional Tory Lib Dem Labour narrative is, is putting out. Um, that, so. so we think that you do need to veer more to, to flexible and responding to, to uh, popular requirements while maintaining some kind of considered political judgment and understanding that even if all of you vote for uh, want a faster horse, with our, our knowledge we understand there's the opportunity for a car. Uh, Henry Ford Paul. Um, I'm just wondering how you think uh, applying metaphors of um, genetic code and computer code to problems of political philosophy that people have been struggling with for like in, in generations is yeah. going to um, shift. Okay, so it's not it, it's not actually I'm not involved in political philosophy and the well anything talking about the role of government in society that's political philosophy. Yeah, it's about it's about the the, the effective functioning of government institutions, and the reason they're failing is because of the culture that they have, not because that they've been too dominated by one political philosophy or the other, right? Do, do you know people who work in local government? No, I'm just wondering about the specific mechanisms that you're talking about, like, so you, you would bring up metaphors of genetic code, you're saying yeah. you're going to re-encode the genetics of okay. the government, you're asking, what do you actually mean by that, like, yeah. specifically? All right, so for example, risk aversion, yeah? Um, Currently, there's a default uh, uh, position on risk aversion that says you don't do things because something might go wrong, right? And what that does is it kind of, uh, so, um, what that does is it, it stops progress from happening or new ideas from being incorporated into the system because there's a default position of this looks unfamiliar, I don't quite understand it, so we won't do it. Right? So what are you going to do to change that? Right, so what we try to do is flip the risk equation. So there's a program the mechanism that we're trialing at the moment, um, which is based on fail fast, fail forward. All right? um, currently, nobody gets penalized if they don't try something new. Right? You do get penalized if you try something new and if it doesn't quite work out, ignoring the possibility that there's a valuable lesson to be learned in there. 
So we've got a quick decision-making tree which says, you've got a new idea. Is it going to kill, kill somebody? If it has the potential to do that, you need to seek guidance. Does it have the potential to significantly financially uh, compromise the, the organization? You need to sit, seek advice. If the answer is no to, to both of those, you implement your idea. And we expect that there will be failures because we know that that is the space in which you learn um, valuable. So I, miss, I, I obviously missed the beginning of the talk. So yeah. in what system are you doing this? Are you doing this in, in a software infrastructure that people... No, local, in government, local government. Yeah. So you are restructuring local government yeah. using a software metaphor? Not so... And how are you doing that? What kind of management structure do you no, have? No, not, not specifically a software metaphor. I mean, we do have... If you, if you want to look at software metaphor, uh, kind of parallels, in policy development, policy development has usually taken a waterfall model, and what happens is you get a policy directive, you align your kind of project and resources, and then you go spending millions for 10 years. And at no point in the process when you realize that the way you've organized your resources isn't actually delivering your intended outcomes from the policy directive, there's no mechanism to stop it, right? So that hemorrhages billions and billions of pounds of money. So in that context, we try to introduce ideas from agile development and saying, can we, can we build kind of reflection loops in a policy process to see if we're actually on track and built in persevere pivot moments. So I'm not trying to suggest that uh, we think that software development methodology is the way that you're going to fix government, but we do look at the, the valuable aspects um, of it in particular context. Yeah? Anymore. Right, so. Sorry, um, just about the, the whole thing, I, I can see making government less risk averse, making them actually try things. Yeah. I can see you know, the benefits for this and how it could then feed back into people being less cynical. But are, are, there, are there not more fundamental things that would need changing um, which would which are going to undermine any culture change? For example, local government in this country is handicapped by not being connected with the, the money coming in. You mentioned people pay the council tax. Not only do you yeah. not see where it goes and there's no transparency, but really most local government money is actually coming from central government anyway. We don't have a local income tax like in Germany, yeah. where local government is very popular, has strong powers, good voter turnout. Um, so, any effort that's put in there, is, is it going to be to a certain amount undermined by that? Well, part of the shift is, I mean, if you want to talk about it in terms of government policy lingo, it's the localism agenda, right? It's devolving more power and, uh, and, and a kind of decision making at, at a local level. Um, where this is really kind of interesting is that on a local level, you have a much greater visibility of your actual requirements and one area next to the other with totally different demographics and uh, geographic um, uh, uh, circumstances. A, a central government view of the thing and then the directives by which the money uh, is cascaded don't necessarily make sense on a local level. And what you're seeing now is um, kind of a, a more, more willingness on the local level to turn around and say to the local government, say, um, we understand what your policy objective is. What you don't understand is that it doesn't relate to the actual reality that we see on the ground. So one of two things is going to happen. Um, either we're going to take your money and we're not necessarily going to obey the rules that comes with that money, or we're going to figure out an alternative way without the kind of the oversight and the, the, the scrutiny that you have in order to deliver on that objective. That's starting to happen more, and I'd say 10 years ago that was probably like, you wouldn't even think of it, yeah? Um, but that's one of the pos positive byproducts of getting independence of thought and releasing yourself a bit from, from, from risk aversion. So the m money is the, uh, the biggie. Who works in an organization with a financial year that ends in March, where departments are frantically spending money in order to spend it by the end of the budgetary cycle so they don't get penalized in the next budget setting something. Not anymore. Not anymore. Right. So you've done something about that. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> but, but does everybody recognize that that, that problem? Yeah. Right? 
So the reason it happens is this fear that if we don't spend what we were allocated, then the accountants are going to think we don't need as much money next year and we'll be penalized. And as a like, uh, uh, that, uh, what happens is that some teams who regularly kind of efficiently run their services have a pile of cash yet left and they're buying new furniture every year, right? Whereas in another department, um, uh, when, the, when the, the, the cuts come, they don't have enough resources to manage the service, so teachers lose their jobs. And that's one of the things that we've targeted. We, we did it on one team, um, and we managed to prevent this one team from, from wastefully spending 1.2 million pounds in this March cycle. That money has now been redeployed to prevent the redundancies in the education. So that with the transport team, money redeployed in the um, education system with the guarantee that this doesn't mean a penalty on your next year budget setting process and some of the reclaimed money being reinvested into an innovation fund to which all teams have a right to bid to do something new that didn't have an obvious source of finance beforehand. Um, if we can get 1.2 million pounds from one team, now we're trying to understand how you institutionalize this new idea into the whole local authority. We think within our local authority, which has a quite modest budget, we're maybe looking at saving 10 million pounds next year. And this is why we want a bigger open development community, because if we can codify how you do that, how you put that, that, um, uh, this mechanism into an organization which traditionally has all of the same fears and uh, thus why that problem is being replicated, if we can replicate this throughout the UK public sector, you're looking at tens of billions of saving. So when somebody tells you, oh, the money is tight and we're gonna lose nurses and, 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 and teachers and uh, essential services, that's actually quite frankly bullshit. It's the efficiency of the way that the processes work that's hemorrhaging money into the wrong place. If we can reclaim that and put them back where it means, uh, uh, where it's meaningful, um, then I think that's a good thing. But it's, that's a very interesting point about this particular problem. It's something that I work in the government, which the government work for. I work in government, and everybody on the on the, the coal base knows that's a stupid thing to be doing. Yeah. But it's an institutional kind of problem. Yeah. So it's, it's, you talk about individuals being kind of robots, but it's the institutions as a whole which are the robots. Yeah. And there's there's kind of the, the, the rules are kind of coming from, from higher up in the hierarchy almost. So it'd be very hard to change that from, for the masses to change it, that you need to be affecting the people right at the top. Sure. The, there's, there's another question there about, um, the, the government departments are built on hierarchical principles. Yes. And society no longer is, by and large. Yeah? It's, it's a networked organism. So. One of the objectives we have is how, how can we transform the, the organizational structure of government uh, agencies and departments into networked organizations? And, and what we understand is the, the, most, uh, uh, the, the form of attack that a hierarchy is most resilient to is a direct confrontation, right? That's when it's really strong. So what we're doing is building network connectivity on, on a kind of uh, uh, and covert way um, with the hunch that at some point those connections become more meaningful in delivering the public value mission than the hierarchical ones which have all these kind of cultural ob uh, obstacles and you get an emergence coming through, right? So, uh, does that make sense in some way? Yeah, but I guess the hierarchy is built around grades and, and pay and uh, senior yeah. and things and you're kind of suggesting that you could be one of uh, everybody's equal type of structure, but I just can't see No, it, it doesn't... It, um, that, that's not the implication that like everybody is an equal node uh, in, in, in the network. Um, it, it can't be that way. But how do you classify um, what value somebody has within the network? Is it now the people who sit on the top of hierarchies are there because they've been there the longest and they've played the game the longest. Yeah? And, and they've generally been promoted to a point beyond their competence. 
Um, so <laughs> we don't think that's a good use of taxpayers' money to pay somebody an inflated salary because they've played the game and reinforced a broken culture and ended up in a position beyond their competence so they use their energy in order to just fortify that position. Um, we look at, we use new human motivational paradigms, right? For the people who get the promotions and can move up the hierarchy are the ones who are most like the people in the hierarchy already. Yeah, but no, it's, it's not an insurmountable problem. Yeah. Yeah. That's so good. yeah. yeah. The, no, there is a shame. Oh, sorry. I got a time. Uh, so you're running out of time. Okay, 25 minutes, yeah. Uh, let's just, any more questions? There's five minutes left, so. And I'll stick around if anybody wants to talk. I, I, I have a job working for uh, HMRC. This was the worst job I've ever had in my life, I think. And they were completely changing the computer system, which absolutely needs to be done. It's the old system that ran, ran the DOS. Yeah. And they had the team that came, came round, who, who basically were the architects, the software engineers, etc. Well, it was only five of them. And we were basically told not to say anything negative about this system. Yeah. And I just couldn't begin to imagine, you know, the, 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 the MD and Marks and Spencer going to visit somewhere and people have been told, told to tell him, don't say anything negative about the system. The one thing he would want to know is tell me what's wrong. Yeah. They didn't want to know what's wrong. They didn't want to know. They didn't want to know. So that's kind of a quite simple cultural hack we find. When you get it into everybody's mind that on any given subject or problem on your plate, you must challenge the assumptions. And there's a, there's a pretty smooth way of introducing that. You go around and you say, what's your problem? And people will say, we need to do this. And you just point out, that's not a problem statement. That's a predetermined pre solution. And we don't know that it in any way relates to actually the fundamental problem. So just dial people back and get them to understand what really is the problem and build back up from it. And rules like, like that, that say don't ask questions or uh, sit in that corner. Uh, and it wasn't even, I mean, you know, I was at a really low level, but I, you know, I heard from other people, which I somebody went to a conference, and, and one of the senior managers said to, to this, this friend of mine, he said, even I can't tell them that there's nothing wrong with this. I've got to say it's all right. Yeah. Well, I think I'm going to kind of leave it and say that's a pretty classic example that demonstrates the idea that the, the, the current yeah. system and culture is broken and yeah. why there's a, a need for it. I'm not saying we got it right, but we're, I think, on the leading edge of having to go. Yeah. Um, and, what yeah. was your website again? What was the... uh, it's yc-yw.co.uk. It's your county, your y uh, y yc-yw. Okay. Y yc-yw. Oh, okay. yeah. um, and I'm, if you want to hook up with me, like I'm the, the Yoda avatar in the whole camp uh, scheme. Um, and in, in September, we'll open our second iteration of our public services uh, hack space or innovation lab or whatever you want to call it. Um, I'm going around issuing a general invitation to anybody that's interested in this field. Uh, let us know that you're out there and then we'll figure out some time that you can, you know, maybe you guys have the answers, whether you, you're, you've got nothing to do with government whatsoever. Uh, we tend to open ourselves that the better answers are probably outside the organizations of the system, so let's create a space to invite you in to, to have a go. So, thanks.